I'm Becky Smith. I'm so glad to welcome you to Highland, Church, Highland Baptist Church to our Friday church session. It's been so good. It's so good to be here. I was just reminiscing on uh, Facebook, you know, how you pop up memories, and Debbie Lemon was talking about memory that popped up for her. Four years ago, it was Fifth Friday. Many of you know what Fifth Friday means. We're talking food. We're talking mm. dinner on the lawn. And there it was. Wayside Choir was singing. We were having dinner on the front lawn. Everybody was having a grand old time. Oh, wow. yeah. Thank God that we have memories like that Amen. because obviously we aren't on the front lawn tonight, but hopefully we will be again. Last week, we had uh, us to say farewell to Jim England. I walked in this evening and it was really sort of strange not to see Jim sitting in the back corner just waiting patiently. So, but at least I think we did it right. We said thank you to him and we recognized his service here for two and a half years with us, week after week after week. It was an uh, amazing thing and I really appreciated it. On Sunday, they had a beautiful recognition for his work also and I hope that you got to see that. If you didn't, you need to check it out because there was a fantastic photo montage. Thank you, Bill Campbell, for doing a lot of those photos. And then on Monday night, there was a drive-by where we all got to see Tom, get to see Jim, got to see all the other staff here too in the parking lot. It was great fun. I think it was very successful. Okay, so Jim's not here tonight, but tonight we have Carol Harston. She will be here as our proclaimer tonight, and we look forward to hearing her message. Um, 
And next week, we'll have Perry Dixon here. And we'll get to hear what he has to tell us. Now, the next thing I want you to remember is 14 days. 14 days. That is, you've got to write it down. You need to count those days. What is it? It's August 14th. Well, what is August 14th? Well, it is the night that Mary Alice Birdwhistle, our new senior pastor, will be joining us. And I want her, and this will be her first service as the official senior pastor at Highland Baptist Church. At least that's what I hope. So I want you to be sure you write, down, write it down, August 14th, two weeks from tonight and be here to join us so we can all welcome Mary Alice. And if she's watching now, hi Mary Alice, we're glad to see you, we're anxious to see you here in church two weeks from tonight. Okay, prayer requests. Please send your prayer requests. Debbie Lemon is in the back of the sanctuary. She'll be writing all those prayer requests down. We'll be giving them to Carol at the end of the service and we'll be praying for you all, weekend, all week long. So please remember that. If that's all on my list, it's time for a call to worship. I'll be reading from the message, Psalm 145. God is all mercy and grace, not quick to anger, is rich in love. God is good to one and all. Everything he does is suffused with grace. Creation and creatures applaud you, God. Your holy people bless you. They talk about the glories of your rule. They explain, exclaim over your splendor, letting the world know of your power for good, the lavish splendor of your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Sing with us. Give thanks with a great. You know, it's the end of the month, and so often at Friday Church over the years, when we come to the last week of the month, um, and of course here we have an exceptional fifth Friday, gosh, we didn't get to eat. Becky, you made me so hungry. Oh, but as we get the end of the month, we do what we call a testimony Sunday, 
And we haven't been able to do that either because we haven't had you with us. We miss you so much, but we love you and we look forward to the day we can do that again. You remember that when we do our testimony Sunday, excuse me, our testimony Friday, uh, that we sing Blessed Assurance. We'd like to do that now. And uh, Marty, what, what was it you were gonna do? She's got a great idea. I think you were gonna have us do two verses and on the last uh, chorus, I'm going to sing it in Portuguese. So yeah. listen for that, it's so very listen interesting. For that. Excellent, excellent. chapter 16, verses 6 through 9, it reads, I call to you, God, because I'm sure of an answer. So, answer. Bend your ear. Listen sharp. Paint grace graffiti on the fences. Take in your frightened children who are running from the neighborhood bullies straight to you. Keep your eye on me. Hide me under your cool wings forever from the wicked who are out to get me, from mortal enemies closing in. Let's prepare now for a time of prayer by singing a wonderful favorite hymn. We do it at Friday Church so often. The greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, loving you, and serve
if you printed out this afternoon um, the bulletin that was on our Facebook pages, you can read along with me our prayer of confession. Forgive us, O oh God, for thinking that there is never enough. We convince ourselves that we do not have enough money, enough resources, enough self-worth, even enough grace. We seek assurance of this perspective from others who also relentlessly strive for more. Forgive us of our selfishness and stinginess. Open our arms that we might give generously, our hearts that we might love wholly, and our minds that we might learn anew of your abundance. Amen. all that's real It never goes away No matter how our feelings change from day to day Angry and afraid but The hunger starts to grow Slowly we forget what God would have us know. There is enough, you will be fed. Leave yourself and come to me instead. Lay your struggles at my feet and prepare to join the feast. When you're ready to receive my healing love, will have enough You must choose the time and journey to the place Find the one and stand before them face to face Sit and have your fill And be satisfied Walk on and remember When you're turned aside There is enough You will be fed Leave yourself and come to me instead Lay your worries at my feet and prepare to join the feast when you're ready to receive my healing love. You will have enough. You will have enough. There will be enough. Good evening. It's good to be here on a Friday night. Um, 
I realize in this setting, where do I look, Jeff? Am I looking at there? Perfect. Questions you haven't figured out yet to ask in the midst of this. Tonight, um, if you're not hungry yet with all this talk about food, then you're going to be hungry now because we have our gospel lesson from Matthew, and it's about being hungry. It's about a hungry crowd. Now, um, families like mine with kids who are hungry at my feet, we eat early, but you may not have eaten yet. And so even during the midst of this, you might want to grab some food and, and eat and be fed while we read this story from Matthew 14. I'm going to actually read from the Cotton Patch Gospel, Clarence Jordan's Cotton Patch Gospel a translation. So this is from Matthew 14 here, this story that I am nearly certain you have heard before. When Jesus heard it, which is that when Jesus heard word that Herod had killed John the Baptist, when Jesus heard it, he left there in a boat to go to a quiet place where he could be alone. But the crowds from the cities heard about it and flocked after him on foot. And when he went ashore and saw what a crowd it was, Jesus was deeply moved by them, and he healed their sick ones. Towards the close of the day, his students came and said, this is a deserted place, and it's already getting late. Dismiss the people so they can go to town and buy something to eat. Jesus told them, they don't need to eat, to leave, to eat. You all feed them. They said, but we have nothing on hand except five boxes of crackers and two cans of sardines. And Jesus said, okay, bring them here. So he told the people to sit down on the grass, and then he took the five boxes of crackers and two cans of sardines. Lifting his eyes towards the sky, Jesus said a blessing and gave the food to his students, his disciples, who distributed it among the people. Everybody ate and had plenty. And there were 12 basketfuls of leftovers. The number fed was about 5,000 men, not counting even the women and the children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I don't know about you, but I have been a faithful Governor Bashir press conference person over the past five months. Uh, First it was, what, 5 o'clock, and now it's 4 o'clock, and I feel I'm about as regular, actually, as Virginia and Dr. Stacks and the graph about St. Louis and Philadelphia. Now, I'm often cooking dinner, and I've got my AirPods in, and Drew comes in to talk to me, and I'm just like, you know, excuse me, I'm listening to the press conference. (laughs) We're going to get through this, and we're going to get through it together, right? The reality is, is that There are many days where sometimes he has new information in the press conference, but there are many days that there's really not much new information. And I will tell you that's actually one of the things I like about the press conference. There is a repetitive nature to them. And in this really uncomfortable time, there is comfort in the repetition. In this time when everything feels so unpredictable and unstable, the repetition offers some sense of ground, some regularity in an irregular season. We humans, we need repetition. Now, don't get me wrong. We love something new and something fresh. But I can only enjoy the new when I have a good foundation of some consistency, right? Too much new and I am way overwhelmed and and just I can't, I can't even enjoy it. And tonight, that story I just read holds way more repetition than it does newness. And so I'm going to go ahead and get the cat out of the bag. Um, I have nothing new to say about this story, okay? I have nothing new that has never been said that I'm going to say tonight about this story. And there are a lot of preachers who are going to preach on this text on Sunday. They've got nothing new to say about this story. Now, this is good. This is really good news. This is not bad because everything that could have ever been said about this story um, is good. 
right? I don't need to come up and say something new, fear not, hungry crowd. The fact is, is that the fact that there's nothing new about this story is the power of this story. Because these are the days that we need to be reminded about the stories we cherish and that we've always cherished. We need to have stories that have nurtured our ancestors. We need stories that have nurtured our ancestors go through hard times so that we can remember we can go through this. And think of it this way. When you go see your favorite band play in concert, you don't go to hear some new songs that they, you've never heard before. You go to hear your favorite song that you probably heard a million times before. You go because that song is good every time. You go because that song that you may have heard all your life, if you hear it again, it still can move you and change you and comfort you. I mean, every time I hear Fleetwood Mac's landslide, I turn to Drew and say, that is the best song that ever was. <laughs> and he looks at me like, I already, knew you, I already know you think that, okay? But I just can't help saying it every time. What is good is truly good every time you encounter it. The good news doesn't become the already heard it news. It's still the good news. It's miracle every time. Now, one of the most common adjectives that we hear contributed to God, attributed to God in Scripture, is steadfast. That God's love is steadfast. God's faithfulness is steadfast. God's forgiveness is steadfast. And I think it's in Scripture a lot because everybody always needs that. To be alive is for our lives to change, and we need to know that God is steadfast. And then when God comes in the flesh of Jesus Christ, we see what steadfast love looks like and acts like and speaks like. The Gospels, even with four different accounts, show that the steadfast love of God looks like repetition. Jesus repeats himself all the time. Jesus often says again what he already said. Jesus often does again what he already did within the same gospel. I point this out because you and I are describing our lives a lot right now like Groundhog's Day. The 90s comedy with Bill Murray who, where Phil Connors wakes up to relive the same day over and over and over and over again. Of course, when we name that we're living Groundhog's Day, it often means in a negative way, like we're trapped and we cannot escape. But what if actually the reliving and redoing and re-saying of our lives right now holds some holiness within it? What if Jesus lives Groundhog's Day because God's love is steadfast in the flesh? Jesus teaches. Jesus sees the crowd and feels compassion. Jesus feeds them. He advocates. He withdraws to rest a lot. And he rises again to begin. Rest, rise, redeem, repeat. Rest, rise, redeem, repeat. Jesus is on a, a loop just like you and I are. This is the story of our faith. God setting a table in the wilderness over and over and over again. Jesus feeding the crowds over and over and over again. Jesus lives these days with us, ready and willing to see us, love us, feed us today and every monotonous day to come. It's a miracle every single time. A hungry crowd surprised by God's feast when they least expect it, when they most need it, this story is one that appears in all four Gospels, which is a rarity. This specific story, if you opened up your Bible tonight and you were looking at Matthew 14, you might have gotten confused if you had seen Matthew 15. The story repeats the, the next chapter. Hearing this story over and over and over again throughout our lifetime might just be how we receive 
God's love as steadfast. Because you and I live through wildernesses. We are the hungry crowd. And we ask, like the Israelites asked, can God spread a table in the wilderness? Psalm 78 names this as the question, loaded with a bunch of doubt, by the way, that the Israelites asked when navigating the wilderness. They were told to trust that God would provide food for the journey, but they were hungry. And hungry crowds are not patient. Hungry crowds are something to fear. Hungry crowds are not allowed in my kitchen while I'm cooking. Hungry crowds are are living without the security of repetition. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. They're living in this moment and not prepared for the next one. One of the things that's really intriguing to me about the Gospel of Matthew is this character of the crowds. If you look through the Gospel of Matthew, you will see that the crowds appear um, throughout the Gospel, almost like they're their own character. And actually, just before this, when when, um, we read about Herod, we see that Herod fears the crowds. As he knows that they love John the Baptist, and he's the beloved prophet whom he imprisons and beheads, But Jesus treats crowds not as something to fear, even as it'll be the crowds who participate in his execution. Jesus turns crowds from anonymous, insignificant masses into known, significant people. Jesus transforms crowds into the kingdom of God. Not just the kingdom, I'm talking about the kingdom, a whole body of kin, a family. This is divine. This is holy seeing. This is what God looks like in the flesh. So if God's steadfastness looks like repetitive action, and if God's love in Jesus looks like transforming crowds into family, then this story of loaves and fishes is the quintessential embodiment of God's character and God's glory and God's power. Jesus sees the hungry crowd and is moved by compassion. Jesus sees you in the hungry crowd and is moved by compassion. Meanwhile, the disciples barely get this. The doubting disciples, of which we are also fully a part, they don't see this coming. Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Best to go ahead and like make some other plans. Send them, send them to town. Meanwhile, Jesus says, why don't you go get the loaves and fish? And we'll see if we can feed our family. I mean, they may be following Jesus around, but miracles are not old hat for these disciples. Because being a disciple doesn't actually mean erasing pessimism from your life. Being a disciple means witnessing more miracles than you expect in a lifetime. Being a disciple just means that you get to see over and over again a way emerge when you thought there was no way. Miracles are God's possibility in our impossibility, and being a disciple doesn't mean that you don't see that impossibility. We all live within it. Over and over again, Jesus teaches them and shows them that God cares for the hungry crowd rather than just fearing the hungry crowd. These are the disciples that Jesus will later gather for the Passover meal, and Jesus will feed them. Jesus will see these disciples as a hungry crowd and feel compassion. Jesus will take the loaf of bread and after blessing it, will break it, giving it to them, saying, take this and eat, this is my body broken for you. Do you hear the repetition in that? It echoes tonight's story. It's nearly the exact same. It's evening. They're settled in. Jesus takes what's already there. He blesses it. He breaks it. He shares it, and he tells them, eat. Eat all of it. And so I close tonight inviting you into a story that is old. I close tonight offering no new fresh perspective or brilliant revelation, but just the story. Now it is evening. 
The day is drawing to a close. You've lived through your week, and it's been whatever it's been, for good and for ill. So get settled wherever you are. Take notice of where you are as you worship, whether it's actually out on a walk or sitting on your porch or driving to the grocery or making dinner in your kitchen. Get settled and allow yourself to be wherever you are. Take what is already here. Look around and see what surrounds you, what loaves and fishes or crackers are around you that are at your arm's reach, what nothing could actually be something, and bless what it is that you have. Proclaim it as holy, as gift, as sacred stuff, able to manifest God's steadfast love for you right now. Break it and share it. See that your nothing is actually something, and it has more power to nurture you and your hungry neighbor than you realized before. Then eat. Eat all of it. Be nourished and name that nourishment as God-soaked, Christ-given, and spirit-induced. It's miracle every single time. Amen. We have prayers tonight that we share, and these are prayers um, that were shared, but also we remember all the prayers that remain unspoken but are within you. We pray for all those who are in recovery programs and all those out in the madness. Prayers for David Elder undergoing treatment for a form of leukemia. Prayers for Professor Bob Campbell in rehab for broken hip. Please pray for my son's full recovery from sunstroke and asphyxia and pneumonia. Prayers for Billy who needs some guidance. Prayers for acceptance of the things that we cannot control and the willingness to let go of the idea that we needed to control those things anyway. Prayers for a teenage friend who's undocumented, has been exposed to the virus, and fearful to get tested or treated. For these and all these other prayers that are within us, we lift them up to a God who is steadfast, who is with us today and every monotonous day to come. Amen. Go in peace. God be with you. Mm -hmm.